eternal father. The one who inhabits eternity. Yet, you are capable of reaching across the expanse of space. To be with us because you are a God who is ever present. One who is omnipresent. One who is always there for us. At any moment in time, we can reach out to you. And even as we think of the cross as a place where Jesus suffered and died. We know, Lord, that his dying has made it absolutely possible for you and for everyone in this world to be saved. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have seen it fit to have implemented the plan of salvation. Help us tonight as we study your word to see the relevance of the plan of salvation and its pertinence to each life represented here tonight. Open our understanding, open our minds to thoughts which are coming straight from your throne tonight. Bless each person who has, all, who has attended this series. Those who have not here today, tonight, but were here Sabbath and at other times. Help them, Lord, to ponder on the words they have listened to. And those who are thinking of giving their hearts to you, may they see that the only real option they have is to surrender to Jesus. At the end of our service tonight, Lord, may we be able to say, surely the Lord has spoken to my heart and decisions will be made for you is our prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Please be seated. Good evening, everyone. Let us try again. Good evening, everyone. Much, much, much better. I'm glad we're out again in our numbers this evening. We had a wonderful time last night as we looked at the man God forgot. I'm glad that there is a man that God forgets. And I know that as he has forgotten, many of us would like to know that God will forget the things that we have done wrong. And remember, as a matter of fact, let me, let me say this. We'll touch it in the judgment on Wednesday evening. But, when all our sins have been blotted out from the books of heaven and removed from a place here that is in your mind, there is a book that is a part of the number of books that are in heaven. It's found in Malachi. It is the book of remembrance. And every good thing that you and I have ever done is recorded in the book the book of remembrance. Whilst our sins will be blotted out, never to remember to be remembered. All our good deeds, what you don't like the idea at all. All your good deeds will be written in that book, and it is a it would have, it would it, it would seem, Sister Murray, that you and I have never seen. You see how great God is? The book of remembrance is going to be opened before God forever, and your deeds in this world will be recorded in that book. Whenever the book is open, they'll see Sister Mary play the organ. She was a wonderful wife. She, you see what I mean? Nothing about the sin that you and I have committed. And I'm glad that God is like that. This evening, we'll be looking at the judgment on Wednesday evening and on Thursday evening, the two covenants. There's a lot of talk about the two covenants, what they mean, who are the persons who are participating in the covenant arrangement. If you have had any thought about the two covenants, come on Thursday evening, we'll be looking at the two covenants, and on Wednesday evening, the judgment. How does it affect you? Will it affect me? But tonight, our subject is, time waits on who? No man. Time waits on no man. Last night, the man forgotten by God. Tonight, Time waits on no man. We have heard this expression from the time we were young. Time waits on no man. As a matter of fact, we have experienced times, times when we are enjoying a certain activity. And the enjoyment of the activity, whether it be worship, whether it be a game, whether it be time with a loved one. And somehow it seems that time was not enough. And there's a Latin expression which, ex, which, which, which speaks to this. The Latin expression says, Tempus, which means time, and forget to fly. And so, 
Tempus fugit means time flies. Is there anyone in this church this evening who would disagree with this statement? I could not disagree with this statement because should you look in the mirror? Should you look in the mirror when you go home tonight? The youngest of us to the oldest of us, should we look in the mirror? The person we see in the mirror is a different person than the one we saw two years ago. And so, without even our being aware, time just has changed us. So let's go. Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 and 2 says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which was planted. There's a time for everything. We all have 24 hours in our day. God has given us a certain number of hours to each person every day. And each person uses that 24 hour period in certain ways. Which we think would be beneficial to us. But the Bible says there's a time for everything under the sun. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. And so as we consider the fact that it is appointed unto man once to die. Somewhere within that continuum. Somewhere within the allotted time. Somewhere where the Bible tells us that our steps are numbered. Somewhere where the Bible tells us that God watches over you and me. Somewhere along that time. If I, if I never found the time to make it right with God. It would have been better if I was never born. Romans 3 verse 23 tells us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single person bar none in this world today. We have all sinned. Therefore we have come short of the glory of God. And there is a salary for sin. The Bible tells us for the wages of sin is death. So when the king Solomon wrote a time to be born and a time to die. It is relevant that you and I would consider our own time on earth because someday because it is appointed once to die I'm going to die I must use my time well 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 says those of us who die in the Lord and the dead in Christ shall rise first so there's a, there will be a resurrection of those who have served the Lord as well as a resurrection of those who have not and there are two different re rewards. When one dies in Jesus, he's classified as righteous dead or blessed dead. That person would have used his or her time well. Am I making sense, church? <clears throat> Most of us who have entered the corporate world or any other type of employment, you are given a time called probationary time. Most times it is three months. And based on your performance, they may either confirm you on permanent staff or they may say, Mr. Jump, you have not performed as well as would have expected, but we think you have potential, therefore we'll give you three more months. The Bible continues in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We're talking about the people who have used their time well. Their probationary time well. Whatever number of years you have in this world. That is your probationary time. But you don't know how long your probationary time will be. 
We have lost members of our family in their teens. We have lost members of our families in their 20s, in their 30s. Thank God when we lose members of our families in their 80s, although it is hard still, and in their 90s we still cry, and even in their hundreds and we still cry. But when we live for 18 and 19 and 23 and we die, we hear the expression, gone too soon. We need to use our time. So this evening, the presentation is going to be somewhat technical. What is time? The Oxford Dictionary tells us, in definite continued progress of existence, events, etc., in the past, present, and future, regarded as a whole. But what really is time? The Collier's Encyclopedia says, Time allows us to establish when an event occurred in relation to other events. That is, how many seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years, or centuries one event occurred before or after another. Are we together so far? We're talking about time this evening. Time waits on no man. So we have to define certain things so we're able to understand how it relates to me. There are three systems, three systems of time measurements. One, universal time or UT. It is the basis of standard or civil time. Derived from the rotation of the earth about its axis. That is universal time or UT. Ephemeris time, ET, this is what the astronomers use to study the motion of celestial bodies. It is derived from, from the revolution of the earth about the sun. Are we together so far? All right. Then you have atomic time, AT, used in physics to, to measure, to, to have precise measurements, you must use atomic time. It is derived from the operation of atomic clocks, which, as we consider them, they, they, they measure the change of the seasons, atomic mass and so on, like in uranium-235 and 238, when they change, when uranium changes its, it, 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 it's, um, let me find the word now, its composition, its nature. You have to be able to check it properly. When they make the atomic bomb, they have to make sure they know how the reactions are going to be in time. Because if the thing explodes too quickly, <laughs> and so, it also has, it, is, it, has, it has to do with time intervals relating to physical phenomena. Did we know that there were so many aspects to time? The Oxford Dictionary defines eternity thus. In, fin in infinite time, endless time after death. One definition, infinite time, endless time after death, being eternal. Eternity. What does eternity mean? Existing always, without an end or, or beginning, unchanging. And there's one person who lives and reigns. In Revelation 1 verse 8, the Bible says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. So God spans all the spheres of time. God. <laughs> no wonder. Let us... Look at the word eternal now. It is boundless, endless, very great or many. The, in, the infinite God, infinite space is eternal. And that's why we find in Psalm 90 verse 2 the Bible says, Before the mountains were brought forth, however thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. There is no one else like God. God set all these these types of time in motion, man has only discovered them and used them in ways that they would be beneficial to themselves. But what is the origin of time? The Bible tells us in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning. In the beginning, God. So God is the one 
who established time. God is the one who told us the origin of time. Time originates with God. Then, Genesis 1 verse 14 tells us something which is very important. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Read it for now, church. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. We sometimes read these words. We read this verse. And we just read them as if that's that. But they're all of the application. Let us see how we can apply them tonight. Universal or civil time. Let us tie it up with this verse in Genesis 1.14. The Bible says, The evening and the morning were the first day. That is civil time. Morning and evening. Ephemeris time. Where is it? As we consider it, the Bible said, let them be for days and years. The celestial bodies were there to mark out days and years. Let us see how this happened. Let there be light. It came like that in a flash. Let us, exp- let us analyze it. There was atomic time. Let there be light. Atomic time. The flash of light that came when God said let there be light he was using atomic time because this atomic energy only God knew how to set it in motion then we find it happened in a split second and that's how the big bang came they looked and figured it was out of nothing by nothing from no one but God is a master and when God spoke it was done he commanded and it stood fast that was atomic time as we consider the fact, how does the, 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 the day part come in? The time, the day, a day is the time the earth spins on its axis. As we consider this fact, the month, the month is the time the moon orbits the earth. So we get a day by the time the earth spins on its axis. We get a month by the time the, the moon orbits the earth. The Bible said, these bodies were for what? For time, for seasons, for days and years. Am I making sense, church? But as soon come. A year. A year is the time the earth orbits the sun. It takes to make one complete orbit around the sun. So God set the, the system in motion. And we are sure. We can surely say tonight. God is the master of time. Whose time? It is God's time. But God has lent me some of it. For a reason. He didn't put it just there to entertain us. Galatians 4 verse 4 tells us something. It says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. So God is a God of time. And he's a God of timing. Let me repeat it. The Bible says, When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. God is a God of time, and he's a God of timing. There is not a thing that happens in God's scheme of things which is not in time. Nor is it not in timing. That is why when we recognize from the scripture that Jesus' friend Lazarus was, was sick. And he was sent for. And Jesus waited four days. Yet when Jesus came, he was on time. <laughs> in our economy, he was late. But he was on time because he's a God of time. And a God of what church? Timing. And this time and timing has relationships to every single thing that happened under the sun. That is why Solomon said, there's a time for everything. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. There's a time to pick up sticks and a time to throw away sticks. There's a time to keep quiet and there's a time to talk. Temporal means will pass. Eternal means it will last forever. So which of these times would you really prefer? 
Would you prefer temporal, which will pass? Or would you prefer eternal, which can't finish? Answer so weak. Eternal. Why do you want eternal? Because we said earlier, it, is, it will not end and we will not die. But the decisions we make every day is forming a conclusion of sorts. I may say I, I would prefer not to have temporal which will pass, but the things that I'm doing are lining up with a temporal life, a temporal, 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 making no provision for the eternal. Everything we do has a relationship to one of these two. I can be in my temporal, but then I recognize that eternal is more important and I can change course. So coming to the series is to help us to understand that there's a difference in time. Eternal and temporal. And my existence on earth, God would love for me to choose eternal. But my actions and my conclusion can end in temporal because when I was a little boy there was an expression that people used it said the way to hell is paved with good intentions we may want to do the thing we may have planned to do the thing but we never did it and so little by little the decisions we make every day they are causing shaping my destiny and some people feel I can change at any minute. But when we cultivate certain habits, they prevent us from doing the things that we would have liked to have done. That's why Paul said, the good that I would do, I do not. But the wicked thing that I didn't want to do, that's what I did. Paul is reminding us that we are carnal beings and we are prone to sin. We love sin. We don't like the consequences of sin. It is sin that, ca it is sin that causes death. But people would tell us that it's heart attack that kills us. Or it is a stroke that killed me. Or a cancer. These are just the agents of death. But they are not the things that really kill us. It is sin. And uh, you may feel that, my, that, that this statement is incorrect. But I want you to analyze it in your spare time. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible didn't say the wages of sin is cancer. It is cancer is the agent of doom. But it is sin that causes the whole thing to have started in the first place. Because before sin there was no cancer. There was no heart disease. There was no old age. And we have come to a place and time where we say it is natural for me to grow old. It is natural for me to have great years. It is natural. It is natural. It is natural. But when God made the world it was not natural. Because there was no sin. And you and I need to come to the place where we hate sin to the extent where we say, Lord, we want this sin problem to be finished. And I am going to help you to finish it. I can misuse, and I want you to read this thing carefully as I read it. I can misuse my a lifetime, meaning the time where I'm alive, but effectively plan for and gain eternity, eternal life. Now, what is this the preacher is saying? I can use my lifetime. Misuse my lifetime. But while I'm misusing my lifetime, I'm effectively planning for eternity. But that sounds as if it is a contradictory statement. Let us look at the thief on the cross. It is one in Luke 23. The thief on the cross had spent his life killing, stealing Doing all kinds of fraud. He had heard about Jesus, but he wasn't paying Jesus any mind. Something was written deep down in his mind. And when he came face to face with Jesus on the cross, and the other thief was cursing Jesus, he remembered that he had misused all his time. But here's an opportunity for me to make it right, Master. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He had misused his life. 
ostensibly he had misused his life but on the cross he recognized what was important and he said Lord remember me that man was told that he would be in paradise with Jesus he had misused his life so no one has gone so far that you can't be saved And you are here tonight and you know you are not saved. It is this message that will help you to see that it is time for me to give Jesus my life. Because I don't even know how many minutes more I have. The thief did not know how many more minutes he had. But he knew that he was going to die. And, and don't believe that I am contradicting myself. As I have fought the thing out and the Holy Spirit is telling me what to say. God had planted a seed. Every single person in this church tonight, you have been exposed to the Bible. You know of someone who is a Christian in your family. You have been to church. Therefore, the seed has been sown. It is a time must come when it must germinate. The thief spent a life stealing. But the thief recognized when he saw Jesus, he saw righteousness and he realized that my life is worth nothing. I have lived and I have lived a life and Lord, just like the publican who went down to the church and he wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. The man who had spent all his days giving tithe and, uh, and living as if the way he wanted to live. He was doing living well in his own definition. And then he said, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like those publicans out there. I tithe, I this, I that. And then the publican came in and said, Lord, be merciful to me a sinner. And Jesus asked, who went home justified? The man who saw his need for God. And if we never see our need for God, we are in trouble. The opposite to the statement that was made first is, I can use my lifetime well and lose eternity. There are people in this world who have lived lives which have been fulfilling lives. They are looked on as men and women who have achieved at the highest level. They have done great deeds. They have performed in their tasks at work, in rearing their families, at the job. They have been excellent. But these people never come to a knowledge of the truth. They never spend any time at the foot of the cross. They never knelt at the cross in a meaningful way. And so they have used their time in the eyes of the world. Well. But when it came to the time of their death. They had made no provision for eternity. Example. Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira were members of the church. Ananias and Sapphira evidently were in good and regular standing. <laughs> They're in good and regular standing. And so the disciples determined, the apostles determined that they wanted good relationships, social relationships and fellowship in the church. So they said, let us sell what we have and give to the church. Ananias and Sapphira let us say they owned a piece of land. They owned 100% of the land. But they told the apostles. Ananias came in first and said, We have sold a piece of land. We had a 10 Phoenix Avenue. We sold it for $10 million. And, and we are, we are, we, I am bringing the $10 million. But he had kept. It had been sold for $15 million, And he took five. He dropped dead. Sapphira came in three hours later. And the same story is repeated. And Peter asked her, you sure that is what you sell the land for? And she said, yes. She dropped down dead. She had been living her a lifetime well up to that point. And that's why the Bible says, it is not a one save, always save situation. Because when the dog returns to its vomit, the Bible says, if the righteous man lives... And turns to a life of trespassing or transgression. And he dies in that condition. All his righteousness will not be remembered. He would have died in his transgression. And he will be lost 
Whereas the man who never knew God, like the thief on the cross, can be saved. They both have used their time in ways which have framed their eternal destiny. How am I using my time? How are you using yours? There are expressions such as these. Time is longer than rope. When people trouble us, interfere with us, we say, go on. Time is longer than rope, meaning time will take care of you. There's another one. Time is a healer. Most times, you hear people sing some love songs when their husband or their wives or their girlfriend or boyfriend have left them. And they sing songs which tell you, they say, time has passed. I have forgotten you. Time heals. Also, time changes everything. I remember when I could run, jump, walk, skip everything, everything doing the same time. You remember the days when you could run, walk, jump, skip, hop? Can't you try it now? <laughs> try it now. Brother Andy, you remember the days we used to play cricket? We can't play cricket like that anymore. I'm trying to get us to see what I'm saying. There are things that we will never be able to do because what church? Time changes everything. Once upon a time, we didn't need glasses. Once upon a time, we didn't need walkers. And yet we want to live long, but we don't want any walker. We want to be able to walk. But time changes everything. And so we need to remember there was a time when Brother Gray had his head full of hair. No, it just ball. <laughs> My mind will get there one day, Father. Time changes. It says, somebody says, so much to do. If I only had time. We have to prioritize our time. And so as we consider the fact, Mark chapter 8, verses 35 to 37, the Bible says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. There are people who are not planning for God. They think that they are living a conservative life. They are able to pay their bills. They are able to do the things which they want to do. And so they are not thinking about God. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Watch this now. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. So those people who in the middle or dark ages were burnt at the stake for Jesus. Those who were fed to lions for Jesus. And people who have lived since who have been persecuted because they love Jesus. The Bible says they would have lost their life for Jesus and for the gospel's sake. But they are going to be saved. So the Bible asked this question. Jesus was the one who asked it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? All the money. All. You know, I read something once. There was, there was a great earthquake in a part of the Roman Empire called Pompeii. It wasn't an earthquake. It was a volcano that had erupted, right? And all the lava was coming into the city. It was a catastrophe. Since that time, many people died. Since that time, they have gone back to excavate the ruins. And in the ruins, they found the skeletal remains of a woman clutching a chest with jewelry. Evidently, when the lava was running down, she got inside the house trying to get the chest, but the chest was so heavy, but she wouldn't leave it. I wrote a story. I wrote a story of a man. He had worked his life and he had saved all his money. He had, in those days the currency was gold. So he had a bag of gold. 
he decided to say move from he was on a transatlantic journey something happened and the ship was going down so they said man all overboard and of course there were there were lifeboats and so on there so man overboard when the man recognized that the ship was going down the man tied the bag of money on himself and jumped over <laughs> it may sound funny but the fact of the matter is he thought that he was safeguarding his money whereas he was losing his life and were he alive having lost that bag of money he could work and for 10 more bags what will it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose the whole soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul it is when we have we, we recognize what we are about to lose that we start to pay those men on the boat with Jonah when they realized that the storm was getting more more, more powerful and the cargo was so important on the ship but they started to throw the cargo overboard in order that the ship would not be sunk but when they realized that the thing was getting more powerful and they dug up Jonah and they said oh it is that you are not praying Jonah was fast asleep. Jonah said, Any, if you want to save yourself, you throw me overboard. <laughs> We're so finished. It's a very different thing. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein, you do not belong to yourself. I do not belong to myself. The Bible says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The gold, everything. But they that dwell therein belong to me too. Why? Because I made them. And then having made them, I died for them. Haggai 2 verse 8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord. The, the, the university degree is mine. I, I was the one who made your brain. I am, the, I am the one who allowed you to think. I am the one who gave you the opportunity to go to school. Although it is your parents that paid for it. I was the one who gave your parents a job. The Bible then says. Psalm 50 verse 10. Every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle upon a thousand hill is mine. And we have an elder who always talk about everything. God owns everything. Up to, up, to, up to last, up to Friday, Saturday night, elder was saying, all the money you need is in the pocket of God's people. Just ask for it. It is God's. God only lent it to us to see how we're going to handle it. Psalm 50 verse 12. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. He has only lent us these things for a time. It will pass. We die and leave our house, our land, our insurance policy. We die and we leave our cars. And then the question is asked, whose shall these things be? God is saying, read with me now church, your finger is mine, your blood is mine, your heart is mine, your brain is mine, your breath is mine. I'm sorry we have to be so to the point, too succinct maybe, but the fact is, we most times forget that my finger, Jesus gave it to me. Remember now, Jesus made us originally with 10 fingers and 10 toes. Why didn't he make us with 15 fingers and 6 toes? The, very, the number of fingers you have, God designed you like that. And whilst we're able to manage with one arm, that is not the norm. He gave us the ability to adapt. 
Your heart is mine. The blood that's going through your vein is mine. Your brain is mine. So to whom do I belong? I belong to God. But I have to choose to give him my life. He owns me, but he won't dominate me. You have to choose to him. Luke 12 verse 16 says, And he spake a parable. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. We're about to finish. The rich man said, I will pull down my barns and build greater barns. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, read now church please, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. The finger is God's. The brain is God's. The blood is God's. But he never said, let me see how much I can give to the cause of God. He never said, there must be some poor people in my vicinity to whom I can give something. He said, Thou hast I have much goods laid up for many years. Take mine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. This is the devil's formula for condemnation. I have much. Let me eat, drink, and be merry. I will go on a world tour. I will go to Europe. I will go down to Rio. The way they have the Mardi Gras. I will go to Trinidad. For what? Carnival. I will go to Wimbledon to watch the tennis. I will go down to Lords to watch the test cricket. You see, Virgin and friends, everything I will eat, drink, and be merry because I have worked for it, I have acquired it, it is mine. Watch this. Verse 20 said, But God said unto him, Read me now, church, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? The very night the man determined he would build his barn, he didn't know that he only had less than a few hours. Sober in thought. Because it is natural for us to plan for tomorrow. Plan for next year. Like me. I'm planning to have crusade. And crusade. Every time I hear the crusade. It's as if something boil up inside of the past. If you call me a God. You know, I am planning to have crusade. But a time is going to come. When my hands will be at my side. God wants us to know. God wants us to know. It is, a, it is seldom in the scriptures that God actually describes anyone as a fool. He says the fool that said in his heart, there is no God. And if you look at why it is that this man is called a fool, his priority was wrong. His focus was wrong. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. It is my money. It is my time. It, it is what I have worked for. It's my own. And God said, You fool. You have made no provision for eternity. You have, you have made provision for temporal existence. But you have made no provision for eternal existence. Lord of mercy. No wonder the man was a fool. Because he would have sold out eternity for nothing. A moment in time when he was so exhilarated that he said, I soul, you have achieved much. Basking in his success. Not remembering that it was God who gave him success in the first place. And so time will wait on no man because this man didn't have the time and he did not know it because it is time had come. Are you old enough to read the Bible? 
Now some mother or father sitting in this church this evening should laugh when they see this little girl. His own Shari Phipps. That's how she looked once upon a time. <laughs> but if you say Shari now, it's a different Shari. Right. Time changes. See? Are you old enough to read the Bible? Let us read this one now. Then you're old enough to be saved. There are people who tell us that their children are too young. And I'm not here trying to get any number. Don't get me wrong. God has opened my understanding in a way to show me that anyone who is lost, it would have been better if they were never born. And a child who is nine or ten can die outside of Christ. So if the child is old enough to read the Bible, the child is old enough to be saved. And we as parents must encourage them to give their hearts to the Lord and reinforce the parts of righteousness so they will live righteously for God. You remember Samuel? His mother gave him over to God when he was four. <laughs> Are you old enough to listen to the Bible being read? Yes, because nowadays we, we sometimes don't bother to read. We just put on, whether it is in the car or wherever, and we are listening to the Bible being read. Therefore, we are able and, and old enough to be saved. Why? Soon come. Luke 19.10, the Bible says, answering the question, why? For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So when you read the Bible and it says, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. I must apply that statement to me. Paul and Silas were locked up in jail. Paul and Silas were singing songs of Zion. And at midnight, there was a great earthquake. All the prisoners in the jail did not run away. They stayed in their cells. And the Roman jailkeeper left and came to the place and realized that the earthquake had damaged the jail. So he expected that all the prisoners were gone. And one of the things with those Romans, they committed suicide for the first breath. If they think they have done something dishonorable, they kill themselves. So then he knew that if all the prisoners were gone, he would have been in trouble. So when he was about to kill himself, Paul said, no, 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 no. Don't do that. We are all here. Remember, when they were locked up, they were classified as prison board. Prisoners. Prison board. And so when Paul spoke to the jailer, the jailer kneeled down at Paul's feet and he didn't call him prison but this time he said sirs when we serve God we are not any ordinary people we are ambassadors for God God wants us to know that we are his ambassadors we are not any normal person remember when the children of Israel were in Egyptian bondage and Joseph was told that he should bring all his family down to Egypt. Joseph took his father in to meet Pharaoh. And the Bible says, And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. It is the one who represents God that can bless. <laughs> when you give your life to the Lord, it is not something wrong that you have done. You are no less. In fact, you are more. Because with Christ, you are more than conquerors. Amen. Giving your life to the Lord is the best decision you can make. Because God never leaves you. How he met you. He takes you to greater and higher levels of achievement and places. Because you represent him now. You are Christian. And that is why, when my children were growing up, I said to them, your name is Jump. And Jump doesn't do so and so and so. You hear me, boy? 
they don't dare bring that in the house because what is their name? Jump! When you are named Christian, there are certain things you don't think about. There are certain things you don't do because you are carrying the name of what church? Christian! Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, all you have to do, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved and thy house. That is why Jesus Christ, when he came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, I must tell Abraham my servant, because Abraham is order his household. We must order our households without apology. When it is time to go to church, children, put on your clothes. This is church time. I don't have to tell you it's church time. You know, it's Sunday evening and church starts 7.15. And you know I leave here quarter to seven. You better be in the car. I am not leaving you at home and I go to church. Find yourself in the car. When it's worship time, is 8 o'clock is worship, so oh, are you not ready? We are not forcing them. We're teaching them so they know what it is expected of them. And I remember when my father would not allow me to go to parties. No party, no show. Only time you went to show was Christmas Day. So you want Christmas Day to come. <laughs> and I said to myself, you wait a little bit. As I grow big and leave this house, party, 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 party. Sure, sure, sure. When I got old enough and I'm working, I have no appetite for party. I have no appetite for show. Am I making sense, church? My father had trained me to the point where I saw these things. I had access to them. I could pay for them, but I wouldn't use my money to do that because I had no appetite for it. When we teach our children properly and we take them to church, they have no appetite for the things of the world. It is possible. Sirs. Wherefore, my God says, he's able also to say them to uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for you. And when my God makes intercession for me, I am well interceded for. I had an uncle. When we were rude, Uncle Diggle was his name. His name was Baldwin. We call him Uncle Diggle. He was my father's favorite brother. So when we rode and Uncle Diggle is there, no beating. <laughs> no beating because he said, he said to my, my father, Bob, give him a chance. What was he doing for me? Interceding. Come on, man. You don't see the connection. You don't see the connection. Come on, Come on, man. You have a liver to make intercession. If my uncle Digal could intercede for me, I don't get no beaten. When Jesus, who is Almighty God, intercedes for me, I am going to be saved. We are not seeing the connection or we should. You can't save yourself. But Jesus has already died for you and me. James 2 verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Not only that, therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. I can't do the things that are in the law to be saved. All the Lord does is show me where I'm going wrong and tells me, Noel, you need a Savior and his Savior is Jesus. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be for where sin doth abound, grace did much more abound. So we can exchange our temporal system for eternal just by allowing Christ and his grace to take over. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is why he can intercede. He has paid my debt. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. You and I ought to be saved. That love that God demonstrated is the greatest love. For, for God to allow his son to die for me, he must love me as much as he loves his son. The greatest love is God Almighty extending Jesus as my substitute. The greatest gift is a gift of salvation. And so, as we consider the fact, the greatest love, the greatest gift, then what it is, Mummy? The greatest offer. What is the greatest offer that God has given me? He said, For whosoever believeth in him should not perish. It is an offer. He says, all you have to do is believe on my son and what he has done. And you will not perish. You will have what church? Everlasting life. We looked at the different types of time. And we looked at the fact that there are some things that will pass away. But eternity will last forever. God is giving me love. He says, I love you so much. Uh, that I am going to give you the gift of my son. So that you will have everlasting life. How are you using your time? And as I close. There are four important dates. Many dates, more than four, but I'm just zooming in on these four. One, when I'm born, I have no control. My parents did what they did, and I came into this world just as all you came, whether it is section or not. Then, when I'm born again, but I have to exercise my choice. Another important date, when I marry, I have to choose. Right, Brother Dallas? Yes. I have to choose. So I told, I told, I told Pastor Lewis. Pastor Lewis's wife is Metlin, and my wife is Marilyn. So she, he said, I said to him, Pastor, you met Lynn, but I married Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> so you choose the person you're going to marry. And the last, child, the last date is the day I die. Do we have a control over when we die? Seven except when we commit suicide. Four important dates. When I'm born, no control. When I'm born again, I have to sex exercise my choice. When I marry, I exercise my choice. And when I die, I have no control. That is why the rich man said, I am going to eat, drink, and be merry, thinking he had time. But God said, you are a fool. You don't know that tonight is your time. In Noah's day, all the people who are in Noah's day, watch this. The ones who are lost, they were saving for a rainy day. <laughs> Where did they end up? In the ark or outside of the ark? Outside of the ark and all the rainy they were saving for they lost everything. They lost their possession. They lost their, their money. And they lost their lives. All those people who died in the flood are going to hell. Only eight went into the ark. Noah used all he had to prepare for a rainy day. <laughs> One was saving for the rainy day while the others, other was preparing for the rainy day. There's a difference. He used everything to make the boat. And it is a boat that they went into where they weren't drowned. But these people outside, you see this one running with his bag. You see, run, you see him running with his bag. What, what are you thinking it? It's Donny. <laughs> it's Donny. is in there. But he and the Donny are drowned. Whereas Noah had used all his money to prepare for the rainy day. And he was saved. 
Use this time well. And the last thing I want to tell you. You see, if you look at this picture, I will just demonstrate it in some inaccurate way. The changes in our form, in our features, as we grow older. And we come to the place where we can't even get up. Somebody have to lift us up. Don't wait until that time. So there's this cartoon with Ditto. You know Ditto in the cartoon? Lie. Ditto. Why is, it, why is he bringing cartoon in here? Let me show you why. The little child said to his father, Daddy, he wanted to play with his father. The father said, I have to work. I have no, I have no time for you. The little boy said to, to daddy, Daddy, do you know that no one ever said when he's about to die? I wish I had more time to work. <laughs> Most times people start to say, if I did know. That's right. But people know. It is just that procrastination, finish it church, is a thief of time. Notice it doesn't thief, it doesn't steal anything else but time. And it is time that we need to use to choose Jesus. Because God is a master of time. He's in charge of your time. He's in charge of my time. And he says, today if you hear my voice, harden not, don't wait until tomorrow. No one has tomorrow. You don't know anything about tomorrow. The only person who knows about tomorrow is God. And God is saying, when you hear my voice, don't talk about tomorrow. Talk about now. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, N-O-W, not T-O-M-O-R-O-W. Now! Because tonight, you fool. Your soul will be required of you. And to whom will these things belong? That is it.